Hi, I'm Dan Trier, Nodler Professor of Theology at Wheaton College. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Daniel Trier. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to see you. It's Daniel J. What does the J stand for? Joseph. Joseph. Biblical Daniel. names. You got biblical names all the way through. Yes, right? exactly right. <laughs> is, I am that generation. You are. You are. And it is great to see you here on the campus of Wheaton College. Thanks for coming to see the fall colors. Oh, this is beautiful. We love it. It's cooler here than in Houston, as you would imagine. Uh, you, you've just published a terrific book, an important book called New Studies and dogmatics lord jesus christ we're gonna be talking about that book today give us a little bit of a precise about what this book is about in this series we're trying to write dogmatics for seminary students uh, current and future pastors and trying to help them learn theological basics across the doctrines from a an evangelical and usually broadly reformed perspective and I got Christology, which I was very <laughs> excited about. And now you've been working on this by. for years. I have been working on that for about five years. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm slow. No, or at that's least not... the material is very rich. The material is rich, and you know, cranking out a book every year is is not in most people's uh, wheelhouse, right? But if you can if you can do a good book every five years, that's pretty darn good. Well, I'm thankful to the Lord for the opportunity, and probably the relevant uh, feature of this book for the current podcast is it's a theology book that has a section of exegesis of a biblical text as the start of every chapter. So there are 10 different exegetical portions in the book where we dive at varying levels and in various ways into the Hebrew or Greek text of Scripture. Now, in, in this whole series, is that typical, that there's an exegetical section before you get to the... That is not typical. I am a little bit the adventurer here. Fred Sanders' book on the Trinity has a wonderful discussion of how it is that we find the Trinity in the Bible. So he is thinking hermeneutically about how the doctrine relates to Scripture. And other volumes in the series are relating to Scripture in very detailed ways as well, but not in this kind of theological interpretation of Scripture-oriented way where each chapter is trying to have the dogmatic discussion flow out of an initial Mm. exegetical discussion. Well, today we're going to talk about Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, which is a wonderful section. Uh, of that book. It is often cited as and referred to as kind of an early Christological hymn. Did you conclude it was or wasn't a hymn? I lean that direction. Yeah. I leave it to the experts to decide definitively (laughs) these questions. Well, in my next book, I will solve that for you. Please so that, do. Yeah, yes. I'm going to do that. I'm doing one on Christ, Christological creeds awesome. and confessions that's coming out uh, in a few years. So, all right. So, Colossians 1 15 to 20, uh, whether it's him or not, what, what do we find there? Well, I find a wonderful interplay between reading the theological message of the text and engaging the exegetical details of the text here, because we have Eston a bunch of times indicating who Christ is. Right. And yet we, we have so many of these potential identifiers that we have mm. to sort through and ask what's primary and what's contributing to those primary claims. And mm. as I read the text, I see three primary identifiers. He is the Son. We pick that up from verse 13 with the Haas in verse 15 referring back to uh, his identity as Good point. as the yeah, son, the, right. the sovereign son. And I think that shapes the context in which we then engage the prototakos language, which has long been controversial. Mm-hmm. Uh, should we see that as firstborn in a kind of Aryan way? Uh, I think no is the answer to that. Chris Seitz and other recent commentators have provided good arguments for why this isn't just the eldest in a series. Mm -hmm. Uh, It isn't a created being, firstborn in that sense. This is the sui generis heir, and it's attached to Old Testament kings and ways that they have this distinctive, special relationship with God. And it's not a partitive genitive in which he's firstborn out of uh, some other uh, reality, but either an objective, he's supreme over, or a comparative relationship, he's mm-hmm. prior to or begotten eternally before. And so 
Paul had alternatives, which he didn't use, which he could have said used to say created first, but he doesn't. And so yeah. I think this prototokos language, especially when you get other factors in the context, should be taken in a sense of supremacy of his special relationship as the eternal sovereign divine mm-hmm. son, the one who is creating rather mm-hmm. than just yeah. um, created. Yeah. In fact, that's very clearly stated in verse 16, right? In him, all things yes. were created. Yes, absolutely. Or have been created. Some would translate that, whether that's in heaven or on earth, or, or whether it's visible or invisible, all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. it's such, such an emphasis on sovereignty there, too, right, yeah. in, in relation to various powers. So then the second and third primary identifiers I see in the text correlate loosely with the two parts of the hymn, the image in verses 15 through 17. Again, creator, uh, not just created, so image as divine son as well as human being. Hmm. And then reconciler in verses 18 and following, uh, associated with his role as the head of the body, the one who is creating this new humanity in and through his Mm -hmm. resurrection and his reconciling work. So I think the two divisions of the quote-unquote hymn focusing as they do on creation and and on redemption, give us who this son is. He is the image who is God and God reflected in a human being, and then he is the reconciler as the head of a new humanity that's being created in and through his redeeming work. That's a great reading of this text. you got to read it very carefully. There's so much here. It is inexhaustibly rich. Yeah. I mean, looking at every genitive, looking at every sort of estin there is, is a really great way of reading this text. We commend our theologians to this series, New Studies and Dogmatics, this one called Lord Jesus Christ by Dr. Daniel Joseph Try <laughs> Dan, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. You're welcome. Great to see you again, David. Thanks. You know, I just love it when theologians read Scripture carefully and, and skillfully, and that's exactly what Dan Trier has done in his new book, Lord Jesus Christ. So thanks to him. Thanks also to our team here in Wheaton, John Lonsma, Rebecca Larson, and Ian Rosine, who provided for us and made us feel very welcome during our stay. I wish it could last a little longer because we love this place and love the people and just love, uh, you know, the trees and the beauty uh, that's just natural around us. If you need a place to come and study, come study amidst this beauty. And you can do that by going to wheaton.edu slash languages, and you can study the undergraduate. And then if you're interested in graduate studies, Master of Arts in Biblical Exegesis, you can do that here in person. And in 2024, you can do that online as well. That's going to be exciting people uh, living in New York studying at Wheaton College or from Texas studying at Wheaton College. Who knows? We'll wait and see what happens. Thanks for listening to Exegetically Speaking. We'll be back next week with a new podcast.